back again with Jan Talon. <laughs> We've just been talking about the Cambridge Centre for the Study of Existential Risk and with a focus on in the intelligence explosion and risks associated with that at the end. Now we're going to be discussing DeepMind, a, a very interesting company that had created a very interesting AI. Um, now, just and, and as far as I understand, Jan, you were one of the investors in DeepMind, is that correct? Uh, yes, I was an investor and uh, director on mm -hmm. the board of directors. Sure. So what interested you about DeepMind? What was it that sort of got your, you know, caught your eye? Uh, well, it was really a, a, like a part of my uh, strategy where I want to build a sort of a bridge and communication channel between the existential risk uh, research people and uh, AI developers. So I can, because of my technological background, I can basically easily talk to both. Uh, so yeah, I, I remember approaching Themis uh, at one conference. Uh, I think it was in UK, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, where he gave an uh, uh, overview of what, what DeepMind was doing. And uh, yeah, I started talking to him about these issues and uh, and we ended up uh, talking more and more and eventually he offered me that, uh, why, why don't I invest in, in there? Uh, or I don't actually remember who, who, who proposed what, but, but uh, I ended up uh, investing uh, uh, in, in DeepMind and then like uh, being more and more involved there. So some well-known uh, people within the artificial general intelligence community, Demis, um, uh, Hassabis, if I said the name correctly, sorry if I didn't, and Shane Legg uh, were on uh, on the team there, right? And these guys know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, Shane, uh, Shane Legg, uh, Demis Hassabis, and Mustafa Suleiman uh, were the three founders. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing work. Um, now, from I, I've heard stories about what that AI could do, but as far as I understand, it was a um, a combination of deep learning and um, representational deep learning and reinforcement learning, right? Yeah, I mean this paper that they did publish, uh, which I actually haven't read myself, uh, so I don't, I don't know the technical details actually. Uh, was, as far as I understand, yes, uh, about uh, the combination of deep learning and reinforcement. Uh, reinforcement learning to actually figure out uh, what's going on, uh, basically model the game by just looking at the pixel data and uh, then uh, playing it. Hmm. And it learned how to play some arcade games pretty well from from what I've heard uh, and in such a way that it hmm. seemed to be doing some pretty novel things in, in terms of unsupervised learning uh, in a way that yeah, uh, often people assume that a computer can only do exactly what it's told, but um, mm -hmm. this AI wasn't told what it was doing, it was only just fed a stream of pixels and some score data and um, worked out the game plan pretty quickly, you know, um, and so that, that yep. that's representative of, you know, maybe some advances towards the more general style of intelligence that uh, people have been discussing for some time. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's uh, like it's uh, sort of a toy model in very literal sense of the world. Mm. Literal sense of the world uh, of the world at large. Uh, like uh, because like what in a way this is what people are doing. They are, we are basically taking the pixel data as as the uh, as we as we get through our retina and. Uh, and also like audit, auditory data uh, through our ears, and then developing a model of what's going on in the world and what should I do in order to uh, sort of uh, advance my score. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is a kind of a toy model uh, for, the, for the AI. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely like very general in their uh, restricted domain. Hmm. So um, this deep mind was uh, sold to Google. Um, earlier this year, um, which was a, a very interesting thing, but also interestingly, as part of the condition of sale, um, there was an AI ethics board installed uh, as part of Google, and I thought that was a very interesting development. Yeah, I think it's uh, sort of a 
sets uh, again nice example. Uh, like if if it doesn't do anything, I mean, the, it's it's like I mean, I, I know little about Google and how how the processes work there. Uh, so like uh, big companies have like a little somewhat mistrust about uh, for big companies. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, even if it doesn't do anything, I mean, it sets a nice example is that like this is something that you, if you're a responsible technology developer, uh, you should, it should be part of the deal, part of the package uh, that, that you also think about the consequences of your, of your technology. Yeah, and uh, look, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure Google does take their, you know, the consequences of their uh, technological development um, you know, to heart. I, I don't think they just randomly create technologies and not think about the consequences, but it's great that they've, uh, you know, accepted to have a, an ethics board installed um, mm -hmm. and, you know, share the idea that, you know, we should be really careful about what we're doing. Um, like you said, who knows um, what the actual outcome will be, but it's certainly emblematic of the right sort of thinking. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's important to say that, like, I mean, as Martin Rees, my co-founder at the Cambridge uh, Center, says, like what we should be w should worry about are like two categories of scenarios. One is the uh, error, and the other is terror. So, so like you you, you might uh, get situations where you get powerful technology that falls in the hands of like very little, very few people, and you might uh, and who might be doing just a lot of harm to the world, which is the terror scenario. Uh, but also, I think it more likely are error scenarios where you developing uh, uh, powerful technology and have like certain uh, effects in mind uh, that you would like to happen in the world as a result of that technology, and then you basically run it or, or unleash it, and something completely unexpected happens. So this is the error scenario, and I think it's unfortunately quite likely uh, as the technology is that its likelihood increases as the technology gets more powerful. Hmm. So you might have good intentions, but but you're just wrong about your predictions about what's going to happen. Hmm. So therefore, I think it's important to actually do work of, uh, about uh, not just kind of trust your intuition, so just trust your imaginations. Hmm. Uh, instead, actually, have to do hard work about uh, actually pinning down what's going to happen and, and why and how do you control the effects, etc. Hmm. Yeah, I, there's some. I guess there's a, a couple of different views that people have about like how to how to uh, discover the type of risks that an AI could um, possibly create. Or yeah, so one of them is by um, trying to like uh, uh, sort of think of all the possibilities that could go wrong, um, and you know try and counter for that. And then on the other side of the coin, you know, one could be experimenting and seeing what could go wrong. There's risks involved in experimentation, of course. Um, do you see benefit in both approaches uh, or a combination of the two? Mm. No. I think the world is like heavily uh, short of the of the former uh, or sorry yeah former uh, basically uh, trying to uh, do careful research ahead of of of, uh, of the uh, uh, of your actual creations of powerful technology and note that even like even uh, when I talk about kind of experimenting and uh, it's even then, it would be useful to do some research ahead and think ahead, like how would you, how would exactly what we experiment with this, with this thing, in order to minimize the kind of the unintended uh, disaster from experimentation. Uh, and uh, another thing, important thing to point out is that it's it's kind of it's a lazy answer, I would say, that uh, that uh, people who don't actually want to put in the effort uh, in, into figuring out how to uh, make sure that the technology is safe. They basically they are motivated to say, oh, we are just experimenting. We are taking this part where where we basically learn as we go. Uh, it's like it's just something that, that gives them uh, it's an excuse, basically. Hmm. Yeah. Unless it's done properly. 
but but if if you do it properly, then then you have to put in research in, in advance. Right. One thing comes to mind. Um, I think at one stage. Uh, they were thinking of blowing a massive hole in the ground to create a, like a water hole uh, with a nuclear weapon, right? Um, they didn't know much about radi radiation, perhaps, and well, anyway, if they had have done that and filled it with water and used it as a, a water hole for people to drink from, people would have gotten a whole lot of uh, uh, radiation sickness as a result. I don't think mm -hmm. they actually followed through in doing that. But it was, you know, seriously considered, and obviously yep. they hadn't done the research beforehand to, um, you know, a sufficient amount of research to, yeah, beforehand. But like, I don't remember why they they actually didn't follow through with the idea. But yeah, mm. it wasn't because they had found that it was dangerous. <laughs> mm. Okay. Mm. Um. So yeah. All right. So sure. I mean, re research research is never kind of. Uh, fully bulletproof, but I think it's better than no research. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. So, in other words, do as much research as, pl as plausible as, as possible um, hmm. until such time as there's nothing more you can really do, then actually do the experimentation with like a... Uh, and then you're, you're, I guess, reducing the, ac the, the risk quite significantly, although you may be delaying the outcome despite, you know, yeah, d d delaying the advance in AI by doing such, you're um, increasing the likelihood that you won't end up with uh, unsafe uh, or an uncontrolled AI. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Well, do you think that the study of existential risks is uh, underrepresented in the world? I mean, I, I certainly think so, but I, I, I just think it needs to be brought up. And I'd like to hear yeah, your yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah. So there are, as I said, there are, uh, like, a couple of dozen uh, people doing that uh, full time in the world, and uh, their budget is yeah something like uh, three three to four million. Mm. Uh, so so it's like it's just a ridiculously small fraction, uh, it, both in terms of people and, and, and uh, uh, finances, uh, spent on an issue that, that would... Uh, let's put it that way, like if the, if the uh, hypothetical uh, future generations would look back on, on this moment, they would be completely horrified uh, about the carelessness of, of, uh, of humanity uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, proceeding with uh, Technologies and policies that uh, would determine their uh, the fact whether they are going to be around or not. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, um, let's move on to MetaMed then, and uh, I want to ask you what is what is the the MetaMed organization? Mm -hmm. Unless there's anything else you want to say about DeepMind. Uh, uh, I didn't ask. Not, yeah. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So. MetaMed is a, a personal medical research company. Uh, the, uh, well, there are like several sort of insights that led to uh, MetaMed's creation, and uh, so one of them is that uh, there is this uh, sort of increasing trend of uh, everyone doing their own med medical research using uh, internet these days. So if you have like, a, I mean. The majority of people, when, when they get a ser serious medical condition, uh, they will go to the internet and, and uh, try to find more information about it. So in a way, everyone is their own medical researcher uh, these days, which is uh, clearly suboptimal because it kind of forgets the old age-old uh, economic principle of division of labor. You should have like specialization. Uh, and the other insight was that uh, there is uh, actually a good reason why people are doing that because the medical system is a mass-produced system. So if you uh, and if you think about it, uh, it, it applies both to medical science and medical practice. So if you, if you are if you are like medical scientific medical papers are really about the investigate conditions. Uh, so and if you investigate the condition, like is you, you figure out whether something is uh, some condition is sensitive to. Uh, some intervention uh, by drugs or, or, or whatnot, 
uh, you're basically deriving statements about averages. You, you, you investigate that you are like a uh, controlled trial that involves like a population of people and you measure well, how, the, what, how does the intervention affect the average. Uh, it doesn't mean that everyone would get better. Uh, so, so in a way that you will get uh, uh, that that is like a mass production of uh, of a medical system in uh, in action. Uh, and also, like when you go to a doctor, what usually happens? I mean, anything can happen, really. But uh, a typical doctor thing is that you a doc doctor visit is that you go to a doctor, you describe what uh, what your symptoms are, and the doctor basically looks and applies some heuristic to those symptoms. And, and derive, okay, people with those symptoms, they usually have this condition, and usually this intervention ha ha helps, so let's try this intervention and, and uh, or like send that uh, uh, person to that uh, specialist that, that basically starts the process all over again. Uh, so so it's, it's like a system where that is useful uh, for an average person, but nobody's average, uh, and it's also kind of optimized for uh, spending as little time as uh, as possible not necessarily as little money but as little time uh, on everyone as, as possible so so the idea of metamed is that we are actually uh, going to instead of mass produced approach we are going to take uh, like highly individual approach uh, so if somebody comes to comes to us we will uh, treat their problem as if it were a scientific problem so so we will not just uh, kind of uh, uh, apply some heuristics and okay you have this symptom okay let's try that intervention we are, we are going to uh, look at uh, uh, the entire thing, like the demographics and and uh, and the results of the past medical history, and uh, possibly to suggest some new tests uh, in order to gain gain more information. Basically, take what do what scientists would do if they were trying to figure out what is wrong with the system and how to how to change the how to change the system, uh, and. Uh, uh, so yeah, like uh, and the hypothesis is that uh, uh, by applying such uh, individualized approach uh, to every patient and actually literally throwing hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, highly qualified man hours uh, at the problem, we should be able to deliver like uh, much superior results uh, than what you would get from uh, uh, from the medical system in general. Mm. Well, it sounds like a, a lot of people are getting really interested in personalized medicine. Um, you know, they're trying to track their own uh, metrics. You know, the whole quantified yep. self movement is evidence of that alone. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that. I, I bought a jawbone up, but I haven't actually used it yet because I bought the wrong one. I wanted to return it, but they won't okay. let me. Uh, I've got, I've got I the old basis there. Oh, you've, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, the jawbone <laughs> up, which I got, doesn't have. Bluetooth, so I can't see real-time data going to my phone. Um, mm -hmm. the, the horrible Vodafone company in Australia sold me an old model and wouldn't let me return it once I found out. Okay. So, uh, bad karma to those guys. Anyway, so the quantified mm -hmm. self-movement looks awesome. Um, so right. this looks very unique, what uh, MetaMeta are doing compared to a lot of the, you know, the mainstream uh, practices out there. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of people would benefit most from like MetaMed, do, do they have to be particularly sick, or could they just be uh, people who who want to improve or optimize their health? Uh, like I would say that uh, uh, like everyone would really benefit because like uh, I I did an inventory at some point uh, like how how many uh, medical problems that I have. Uh, that are like uh, kind of annoyances, and and but it would benefit like uh, I would pay to to uh, get them fixed uh, in a kind of a reliable and convenient way. I got like a list of like thirty to forty items, <laughs> so it's like just uh, but so in a, in a way like everyone has uh, like are like problems that that uh, MetaMed definitely could uh, could address. The question is like what is the price performance of of this because we don't we don't take insurance money or or uh, we're not covered with any any health plans. It's a matter of like, uh, uh, it's a costly service. Like, it, just like uh, one way of it, uh, describing it is that MetaMed is like a, like a law firm, but in a, in a medical space. So if you have a legal problem, you go to a law firm, and there's a team of people that are put on your case, and and he hence the uh, fees are also like uh, uh, can be pretty high, especially if, the, if it's a complex case. And same with MetaMed, we, we put uh, like a highly qualified team on your case, 
so so the uh, cost of it can be very high. So it tem- so again, but like uh, obviously money has different value for different people. So uh, uh, so like if you if kind of money is cheap for you, then it then it actually from purely utilitarian perspective, it would make sense to uh, have MetaMed solve like all trivial problems that you have. Uh, because the, getting rid of those problems is just much more valuable to you in terms of uh, if measured in money. Uh, or alternatively, uh, MetaMed can be useful uh, for uh, not necessarily like super rich people uh, that have like very complex problems that uh, that the medical system uh, is just not very well suited uh, to debug, uh, so to speak. For example, we have uh, had uh, like a overrepresentation of neurological cases, like. Uh, Different and or different chronic chronic conditions where people have been just like seeing lots and lots of doctors and spent a lot of uh, time and money uh, figuring out what's wrong with them, wrong with them, and not not gotten any uh, good answers. And uh, Metamod has, in some cases, been able to like, completely solve, solve the problem. Hmm. So um, let's just say someone had a like a an under researched form of cancer. Uh, mm-hmm. where there was some preliminary research done, but it wasn't, you know, um, F- there wasn't any FDA-approved treatment for yep. this sort of thing. Is this is this the sort of thing that people would be able to come to MetaMed and say, well, you know, I'm going to die anyway. I want to see what my chances are with cutting-edge science and cutting-edge uh, research on the subject. Yeah, I think so. There, there is, uh, I mean, a few months ago, I, I uh, went to meet... Uh, Professor uh, John Ioannidis, uh, who at the Stanford Medical School, uh, and he has written a famous paper called uh, uh, "Why uh, Most Published Research Findings Are False." Uh, so, uh, an important insight that actually kind of feeds into MetaMed's uh, reason for being is is that uh, even if you have re- have research uh, on on certain conditions or certain uh, Things it's 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 not a, it's not a reliable thing like like most of the pop, most of the published research is false so you actually have to have people who are well versed in statistics and and uh, scientific methodology and and can who can look into the into what actually happened uh, in this particular instance of of uh, research or, or medical trial uh, and then actually derive from the from the data perhaps get access to the uh, underlying data or talk to the researchers. And, and figure out what's actually what actually happened there, and, and uh, does it uh, is it a good evidence for uh, proposed interventions in, in that case? So it's like another example of what you just will not get from the from the traditional medical system. So so uh, again, another another way of, of describing it is that uh, it takes about like ten to twenty years for uh, things that are known in medical science uh, to filter through the system and. So they would get actually applied in the in the healthcare healthcare system, and and one of the reasons is that that there is uh, you just need a lot of evidence, you need to, need to gather a lot of evidence uh, uh, for the for the new treatments before the system that's not able to kind of do a lot of manual checking all the time uh, can trust them. Uh, however, MetaMed can do a lot of medical a lot of manual medical checking uh, for all the claims in the in the new research. So in a way. Another way of framing MetaMed is that uh, if you come to MetaMed, you get uh, uh, get the medicine from like 2020s. Hmm. Well, talking about uh, medicine in the 2020s or the 2030s, even, how do you see medicine evolving then in the next f- 15 to 20 years? Do you think um, there will be a lot more uh, sort of growth in the direction that MediMed is heading? Hmm. I definitely, definitely see a lot of growth in the in the quantified self and uh, and uh, basically uh, in the in scenarios where people are effectively taking their health into their own hands uh, using the using the technology that they bought uh, from the store, not not from not that was not prescribed from to them uh, by the medical system. I think the interesting thing about medical system is that it's not really what people think it is. Uh, the, there was um, uh, an essay that I read a few months ago about uh, a lot of uh, 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 
uh, of Western thinking and Eastern thinking uh, and philosophy. And it said that the Western school of thought uh, tries to model the world as if it were a collection of mechanisms. So if you have a medical system, that's a mechanism where you have like a, like a bunch of moving parts and they were designed, put together in order to help, the peop help people to get better. And then the, the Eastern thought uh, thinks, models the world as a set of organisms. Uh, so it, like all sorts of things, like uh, including the social institutions, are a result of a certain evolutionary pressures over time. And like uh, uh, it, 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 they were never kind of deliberately designed. And I think the Eastern thought here clearly wins out when it comes to modeling what the medical system is. It's a, it's a, like a large social system, well-financed system that is a result of different uh, uh, laws and interventions and, and different uh, motivations. So, so like you can, especially in the US, it's, uh, you can get actually very cynical about what the medical system is. That there is an uh, American businessman, uh, David Goldhill, who has written a book and an associated article called uh, Catastrophic Care, How American Healthcare System Killed My Father. And in that, he makes a lot of a new number of great points. And one of the central points uh, that he makes there is that if you like take a step back and think about what is the business model of American healthcare system, uh, you see that the, the business model is selling treatments to insurance, that the clients of, of uh, medical providers in the US are not patients, the clients are insurance companies. So, so that's why you get like uh, things like uh, like 10 million pap smears uh, being uh, prescribed to women in the US who don't have a uterus. So, so it, it's a basically there are like a lot of uh, uh, like pointless tests and, and, and interventions being prescribed. Like if you have, if you have a headache, you, okay, there's like CT scan for you. And uh, so, uh, so in, in, in one way, so why I'm making this long answer is that uh, I think it's very hard to predict what, what, what will happen uh, to a medical system because it's not a system that's being designed to uh, adopt, uh, I mean, there's a dirty secret in the in the medical system that uh, statistical statistical methods slash expert systems slash AI has been better in diagnosing people for 50 years already. Uh, but like, it's in a way, the medical system does not have a problem with technology. It has a problem with the adoption. Uh, it is not going to adopt certain things that that uh, that might be useful. Uh, so, like. In a way, so I would say that that I see like a lot of cool technology coming up in the next twenty years uh, that are uh, that are useful for people, but uh, I'm not really sure if medical system is going to adopt that. So 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 therefore, uh, I think we should like talk about two separate things, like what's going to happen to the medical system and what's going going to happen to the health technology that that people can use. So mm -hmm. they're not necessarily getting as we see with the with the trend of yeah, things like basis watch here. Like I see I see a trend where people. Are going to get more and more of healthcare outside of the health, out, more and more of effective healthcare uh, by by it outside of the healthcare system. Yeah, well, that's a very interesting point. So, my next question was going to be: How will doctors and medical professionals uh, use technology to augment their practices? But like, um, let's just frame that outside of the traditional healthcare system as it exists today. How will doctors or medical prof professionals then use their technology to augment what they're doing to people um, in like a clinic? Uh, so what will someone's experience of visiting uh, a private clinic be like in the future? Mm. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't feel like I'm confident enough to predict like a sort of particular yeah. scenarios or, or uh, experiences, uh, especially when I see that, that uh, like there are things that the medical system or the clinics and doctors could do today or could have done like tens of years ago already, uh, but they don't. So, so it's, it's not necessary to, you know, to predict what's going to happen in the future when you, when you have a doctor visit, it's not enough to think about what are the technological possibilities. Uh, you should also think about what is the motivation for the system to adopt those, those possibilities. And this is like very, very hard because it's an evolved, evolved system, hard, hard to predict what's, what their motivations will be in the future. Hmm, hmm. interesting. So, um, I, I might 
time is running out here. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, is there any um, concluding statements you want to uh, bring up about MetaMed and the uh, well, the medical system that exists today and the way you hope it will evolve in the future? Uh, yeah, I think uh, MetaMed is trying to you know, ride the tr sort of wave or, or trend of uh, uh, bringing more sanity into into the medical uh, system and people's health in general. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it's like it's a like fairly unique uh, uh, offering. So, so it's hard to hard to see how uh, how much we can we can do there. But I'm I'm glad to glad to see that. Yeah, with this uh, quantified self movement and and. Uh, in general, like uh, people uh, doing their internet searches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, I think the trend is in the in the right direction. That uh, uh, there is more and more options uh, for people uh, available outside of the outside of the traditional healthcare system, and MetaMed is trying to be like one significant option there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure having you again, Jan Talen, and uh, yeah, I. I look forward to meeting you again. And um, yeah, thanks so much for your time. And yeah, we'll have this up Thank online you. soon. And thanks everybody for listening. Please subscribe. <laughs> Cheers.